And those whom He predestined, He called. And those whom He called, He justified. And those whom He justified, He glorified. What are we going to say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare His own Son, but gave Him up for us all, how shall He not freely with Him give us all things? doctrine and Christian theology and what we are to believe as the scriptures say. Uh, well, I hope so. And uh, now we're, in, we're getting into the meat of things after we learn we're totally depraved, but we learn that we are now drafted into the family of Abraham and now that we're, we be reconciled with Christ, not through a physical circumcision, but the circumcision of the heart. And then we've learned that although all men have fell into sin because of one man, the man Adam, we learned last week that we were redeemed because of another man, the second Adam, Christ Jesus our Lord. And so now because he, uh, he has saved us, we have now been grafted into his family and are able to be joint heirs with Christ, who is the firstborn of those. And we'll kind of get into all of that, but let's start here uh, in Romans chapter 6, and we'll read, oh, there's so much meat, there's so much good stuff, uh, but we're going to go ahead and read from verse number 4. Romans chapter 6, verse number 4. And if you got it, say amen, so I know when I can move on. Okay, cool, cool. We got it, we got it, we're good. All right. Uh, I'm reading from the CSB. Is our it is our tradition. So if you're on uh, your, your your app, your thing, go ahead and switch it to CSB for the sake of continuity. And it reads as such: Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too may walk in the newness of life. Uh -huh. Let's pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we ask that you have your way. Bless this message. Let it touch the hearts and minds of your people, conforming us more and more into the image of your son. We thank you. We ask that I decrease and you increase. Order my steps and order my voice. In Jesus' name, I do pray. Amen. Okay, if I was going to give you a subject or a title uh, for tonight, Come on. it was, it's leave it in the grave. Come on, now, Leave like it in the, in the grave. Now listen, I love a good zombie movie. I don't know about you guys, a good yep. zombie flick, maybe, maybe not. See, most time I don't like scary movies. Oh, I'm not into being afraid, okay? God did not give us the spirit of fear. Come on. So I normally stay away from a little scary movie, plus there's generally a bunch of BC actors, and they're just not that good, right? So I can't <laughs> skip out on the scary right. movies. But a good zombie flick, I don't know, something about it. It doesn't really scare me, but it's like intense. It's like, don't go in there. Don't, don't you do. I know they move. And they're not like, really scary because zombies kind of move slow. They don't like they don't like run and chase you down. They say like the World War Z zombies. Those ones just, those good movies. wasn't cool with those ones. They gave them sprinting abilities. Like I don't know when yeah. the dead thing moves. Right, like that. Yeah, right, right. But like the normal <laughs> zombies really ain't that scary, it's right? Slow, slow, uh, right. Uh, but I, I, you know, I watch those and generally they all have kind of the same setup, right? So you'll have this one guy who gets infected because he did something weird. He ate. He went like to, to some deep African jungle and ate <laughs> some fruit that he had no Come business on. eating of, or some bad ate him, or something strange happens, right? He gets in contact with. Something that he had no business getting in contact with. Oh, uh, that's a preach to somebody. But anyway, he gets hey, in contact good. with something he had no now. business getting in contact with. And so he becomes the first one infected, right? And then he goes back to normal civilization, suddenly starts not feeling good. He dies, gets back up, and he's like some creature now. He goes and sees somebody else and bites them or scratches them or whatever, you know, whatever your your um your, your study of zombieism is, whatever. He does that and he passes on and now one person gets a zombie, get, becomes a zombie, then another one, and then another one, and then another one, and all of a sudden we got this zombie outbreak all over the place. Amen. Right? And then we got like a serious problem and you got like the zombie force comes in. And, well, you know how the story goes, right? So so this is like the normal plot. They, they have, always have the same plot as like they're teaching some sort of truth like they got from somewhere. I don't know, there was, there was a, a one man named Adam, right? Check this out, I don't know, this might correlate, I don't, it might. But there was one name, man named Adam, and he was good until he went and ate something he had no business eating, my God, today. And when he ate what he had no business eating, he became infected, oh my goodness. And the wages of sin, as the Bible tells us in Romans 6 and 23, is death, right? The wages of sin is death. So now, 
without sin and death are married in such a way that they can't be uh, uh, divorced out in scripture. They're one in the same. To sin is to die, and you die because you sinned, right? So he became infected with this, and now he died, and because he died, now everybody else has been infected with this zombie outbreak, I mean this sin outbreak. Right. Ah, uh, y'all right. pick up what I'm putting down. See, 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 there's some kind of correlation here between dying and spreading something when you had no business touching a thing. Oh, Lord Jesus. Can I start there? Can you just take your hands off of stuff you ain't got no business touching? See, see, God has given us grace and he's given us mercy, but sometimes if we act outside of his will, act outside of what he tells us to do, we can become infected and now spread our disease. Oh, Jesus. We wonder why some of us got so many problems. Uh, well, let, let's, let's just let's just keep going. Uh, um, if we get into uh, the book of Romans, uh, it talks a, a lot about death uh, and, and being dead to things. Right. Uh, that, that's the, the general uh, idea here in the book of Romans is that we are now dead to things and, and, and that we uh, um, have got this infection in us. Uh, but we died with Christ, and now we rose again. That's the good news, Amen. right? That's the good news of it, right? That's the verse we wrote, 6 and 4. Romans 6 and 4 says, yes, we, 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 we died with Christ who paid the price for our sins, right? So if we die with him, then we get to raise with him. And so we're like, this is not the kind of zombie that kind of moves slow and falls apart and all this. No, we get to raise with him in the newness of life. Doesn't new life sound good? Yes. Isn't that a term that sounds a bit familiar to us? See, see, in the 60s and 70s, this, toy, this term in Christendom kind of got really popular saying that you're born again. Or I'm a born again Christian, right? Okay. When we used to just say we're Christians. That's, that was the normal thing for a couple thousand years. And all of a sudden we have to qualify it and say that we are born again Christians. We have to make this qualification because so many Christians had just a, a form of godliness. They had this Christian ideology, but didn't really believe in Christ Jesus. So they had to say, no, no, I'm a born again Christian. We have to make that distinction. Why do we make that distinction? Because there was something new about the experience we had. There was new life. So for us to have new life and to be born again, wouldn't that suggest that at some point we had to die? Yes. Amen. Amen. We often say, I'm born again. He rescued me. I'm a new creature. In Christ, I'm a new creature. And so this old oh, things are passed away. I buried the dead man. But yet the dead man finds himself like a zombie. See, see, most zombies, uh, they, 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 they come back right away, right? But but some zombies, if you if y'all remember that, see this guy named Michael Jackson. I don't know if you ever heard of him. He did a little music in the 80s and 90s, 60s, a you know, long, long time ago. Uh, anyway, he had this song called Thriller, right? And it used to spook me out when I was a kid. I really shouldn't have been watching it. I was too young. But anyway, I remember I was watching it. It had the little beat come up. And I was seeing Michael was running around. And Michael was dancing. And yeah. he was doing his whole thing. But it always got to this part where all of a sudden, Michael looked like he was dead. And I was like, oh. Our eyes would get yellow and all this stuff. Right? And then all of a sudden, you would have all these things, these, these zombies coming up out of the grave, pop locking. They was coming up. <laughs> <laughs> They was doing all of this, right? Coming up out of the grave. And it was like, what in the world? This is terrible. The young lady be running and, and Mike and him is chasing her down while they grooving. And it's just a bad situation. Many of us, our sin and our old man works just like those zombies. Wow. I want to speak to some people tonight whose zombies are pop locking out of the grave. Right. Somebody whose past life won't stay buried. Right. Somebody whose past life we're allowing to have life and it's coming up and it's causing us problems as Christians. Right. We're supposed to not, not reform our old man. We're not supposed to work on our old man. We're not supposed to, to find a way to, to, to breathe new life into our old man. Our old man is not going through a 12-step process. Our old man is not being worked on and configured into the image of Christ. No, our old man must die. Our old man must die and be put in the grave and buried. How else will we be born again if we don't die to our old sinful nature? Let's get into some reading. So let's go. We're still Romans, the sixth chapter, chapter, uh, chapter six, verse number one. Starts off with this whole old uh, um, saying that we've heard and we've dealt with and we've dealt with it a little earlier. We'll continue to deal with it throughout the book of Romans. But it's this question that gets asked again. What shall we say then? Should we continue in sin so that grace 
may multiply. Here's the big question, right? We just finished chapter five. We're talking about grace. We were saved by grace. It was Christ who graced it to us. Grace meaning that it's unmerited favor, right? We didn't do anything to earn it. It's freely given. So if we're preaching as Christians of grace that is freely given, are we now saying that it's okay to sin? Are we saying that if we sin, that only shows more clearly the glory that God has, so we should continue in this action? No. Absolutely not is what we get in verse number two. Absolutely not. See, the Bible gives us no room for sin. Jesus never says it's okay to sin. God never says it's okay to sin. There's no chapter, there's no verse that breaks down why it is okay for you and your mortal body to start sin. Whew. Well, hold on, we talk about grace. You told me about irresistible, irresistible grace, a grace that was pulling me, grace that covered a multitude of sins, a grace that Jesus died for, he died for past, present, and future sins. Why then, why then, if, if, if we have a, 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 this relationship that says we should not sin, why do we keep on sinning? If I'm supposed to be dead in my old nature, why does my new nature, this new man that you say that I am, because of my conversion, because of my experience with God, why does that new man keep on sinning? Ooh, that's the big question, right? That's the elephant in the room. We'll address it in a minute, but first we've got to deal with something I call loophole theology. All right. Loophole theology. What is loophole theology? It's the idea that I'm going to study the scriptures I'm going to live in relationship with God in such a way that I figure out ways that I can kind of like get away with stuff. That's what this question is. Right? Should we continue in sin? Some people say yes. Because I realize that, that as long as I con confess my sins, that Christ is faithful to forgive them. As long as I, 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 I do certain you know, things that, that the Bible tells me to, to repent, I repent, as long as I repent before I die, I'll be good. We kind of taken on this mindset that trying to find a loophole in serving God. That's absolutely absurd. It's crazy. We are in relationship and in covenant with God. In our relationships, okay, okay, I, I have children, right? We're in covenant relationship, right? right. I take care of them, and they try not to get on my nerves. No. <laughs> <laughs> I take care of them and they're my children they're supposed to listen to me and we love each other and there's a covenant relationship in between me and my children right now now imagine if I tried to find every loophole on the list that kept me from having to take care of my kids oh well it actually says I only have to provide for them three square meals a day and I don't go to jail oh that's all they give me I ain't gonna give them no snack when they ask it would that make me a good father would that be a healthy relationship if you were in a relationship where you're married to somebody, right? And they were constantly looking at a way on, to step out on you that isn't exactly cheating. Come on, Marcus. Good. Right? Well, I didn't good. really, I didn't like kiss wow. them. Come on, Marcus. Wow. Preacher. Come on. Marcus. I just went on, we went on a date, but we didn't like touch each other. So is that cool? No. no. Come on. We would consider good. that a horrible relationship Come that on, we Marcus. would want out of right away. Yet so many of us try to teach, treat God that way. We try to treat God in a manner where we're looking for how much we can get away with instead of how faithfully we can serve and cling to God with all we have. We got to get away from the idea of loophole theology. The answer that Paul gives is absolutely not. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Or are you unaware? Ooh, that's, a, that's a good one. Underline that if you're in your Bible right now, you got your, your paper copy. Underline or highlight and you're unaware, unaware that you, that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. Are you unaware? Is there some knowledge that you don't have? Come on, Marcus. Have you not been taught? Are you unaware of this thing? And many of us live lives unaware of the power given to us by Christ Jesus. Are you unaware that you died and you were baptized with him? Into his death. Right. And now that's what that's what physical water baptism represents. That you were back. You're saying, listen, I've been baptized with Christ. I went under and now I came back up again. Well, right. Okay. Have you been baptized in your spirit? Have you been baptized in your heart? Have you been baptized in a way that says the old man has went under and died. And now I'm up a new creature walking in this new birth. Right, 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 right. Hmm. 
Seems like we're setting the bar really high, isn't it? Or are you unaware that all of us were baptized into Christ Jesus, uh, into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too, so we too, so we too may walk in the newness of life. For if we have been unified with him in the likeness of his death, we will certainly, it says maybe, I thought, maybe. Certainly. I think I misread. Certainly. We will certainly Hallelujah. also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Read the word. I want to talk to somebody about certainties. Certainties. See, we as Christians got to stop living our life like a maybe. Like a maybe. We walk around like maybe God died for me. Maybe my sins are forgiven. Maybe I've been redeemed. Maybe I've been changed. Maybe he's done a work inside of me. Instead of walking with the certainty that he who started a good work within me is faithful to complete the work until the end. Like I don't have to wonder about God's preserving power for my salvation. I don't have to wonder if God can pull me up. I don't have to wonder if I might be able to stop this sin. Ah, Jesus, I want to touch you right there for a minute. Stop thinking that there's certain sins God can't deal with. Say that. Good, talk that. It almost makes me feel weird as a Christian when we talk about addictions because a lot of times people say, oh, that's addiction. But we, we know God can say this, but he's going to deal with this addiction or she's dealing with this addiction as if God doesn't have power to reign over addiction. My God. There's nothing that God doesn't have power to bring you out of. The same power that rose Jesus from the grave is the same power that dwells on the inside of us. Therefore, we can die to sin and say, stay buried. I hope I'm not coming on too strong. Certainly, also, be in the likeness of his resurrection. For we know, see, some things you might have been unaware of, but you might have been unaware of a thing, so Paul fills you in. Now you know. So that goes, that fits for all of us. We were unaware, maybe you were unaware that you were dead to sin. Maybe you were unaware of it. Uh, I heard the example that, you know, the uh, Emancipation Proclamation went out and, 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 and Lincoln had freed the slaves. But, but many slaves, and then I think the last ones were in Texas, didn't find out that they had been emancipated two years later. They were unaware mm -hmm. of the change. Mm -hmm. Many of us Christians live that way. Unaware that we've been set free. Unaware that there's power and deliverance that's available to us. Ah, Jesus. Certainly also be in the likeness of his resurrection. For we know, this is what we know, that our old self was crucified with him. <coughs> that the body ruled by sin might be rendered powerless. How much power? Powerless. 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 Power, it had power. Now it's power less. Less power so that we may no longer be enslaved to sin. No longer enslaved to sin. Since a person who, was, who has died is free from sin. See, sin equals death. As I said before, death equals sin. The only way to get from sin is to die. That's why Christ had to die in our place. So when we are crucified with Christ, we have now died, therefore paying, oh, somebody, oh, yeah. it. therefore paying what we owed by being grafted into his death and his resurrection. So that what you did before can truly be dead because it's been paid for. Sin, you don't have to be a slave to sin because it's been paid for. Right now. The price has been paid for. Mm. Now, if we die with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him because we know that Christ, having been raised from the dead, will not die again. Woo! Let me talk to you real quick. There's no double jeopardy with this. That's some good news. There's no double jeopardy. You can't be tried again for the sin he died for. That's it. See, 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 the sin has been buried. 
and now it's getting it's getting this thriller on, and it's trying to pop like its way up out of the grave to start coming after you, start dragging you down to try to catch you, to try to corner you. But that thing can't get you again. You no longer have to be a slave to it because the price has already been paid Lord. forever. Lord, forever. Hallelujah. Forever. Thank you, Jesus. My God. Ah, Jesus. Raised from the dead, will not die again. So we're going to go to uh, verse 10. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all time. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you do consider yourselves dead in sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. I want to stay focus on that word consider. Or if you're reading King James Version, it might say reckon. I reckon myself dead. I consider myself dead. This has to do with your mentality and what you've learned about yourself. I reckon, I consider, I have looked at the sum of all things that have happened in my experience with Christ, and now I reckon myself, I consider myself to be dead. I no longer consider the old me alive. Thank you, Lord. So, so then, let's get back to our big question. If, Pastor, you're telling me I'm dead to sin, Pastor, you're telling me I got saved and that there was a conversion and the work of the Holy Spirit drew me unto, him, unto God's self and that, that, that I was changed and forevermore and I took part with his death and that I died unto him, unto myself, and I'm alive unto him, right? So, so then why is it that we as believers still sin? Because the Bible tells us if we say we have no sin, we don't tell the truth. If we say we have no sin, we lie. We all struggle still with sin, though we say it's dead. Well, here's a couple ways to look at it. Uh, see, if you've ever been around a dead body, unfortunately I've had that privilege a lot of times in my other profession. If you ever get around a dead body, sometimes the thing will be dead, the body will be dead, but there'll still be movement from the body. There'll be a point where the arm might throw itself up. It might be laying cold flat on a table and then the muscles twitch and it falls off. And we think, oh my gosh, he's still, he's still alive. But there's no pulse. Wow. See, a lot of the sins that you used to be involved in, a lot of the things that you used to be a part of will still twitch on you every now and then. My God, my God. Come a lot of the things that, that, that you were dealing with will still move and they will shake and it will scare you into believing, my God, today that you're the one that's the zombie. Ah. It will scare you into believing that you haven't truly died and been born with new life, but that you died and that you rose as a zombie who's still, uh, uh, still rotting on the inside. See, the thing about a zombie is we know most of them move slow outside of those World War Z ones. They move slow. And see, you'll start to believe that you're still a sinner, and it'll cause you to move slow in your purpose. It'll cause you to move slow in your call. It'll cause you to drag yourself. And you'll constantly be looking at yourself like I'm falling apart. There's, there's worms eating me up, and, and, and I'm not really born again. I'm just a, a, some kind of shadow of who I used to be and some kind of struggle. But we have to see, what does God say? He, why does he do this thing? If God can easily, in the moment he saves us, God can easily, in the moment he saves us, just at a blinking of an eye, take away all sin. We know that because he promises to do that in heaven. We'll be sinless creatures. Right. In the moment that we enter into the kingdom, sin will be no more. We won't struggle with Thank sin in heaven. So why is it then at the moment of conversion, at the moment I give my life to Christ, how come he doesn't snap his finger and remove all sin from me? How come he allows the twitch? How come he allows the kick? How come I still struggle with sin? Well, let's look to the word. Let's go to 2 Thessalonians, the first chapter and the 11th verse. 2 Thessalonians, the first chapter in the 11th verse, I'll give you a while because most people don't read Thessalonians. It's not, not the book. Everybody's in turn to Thessalonians a lot. Okay, I believe we're there. Second, th second, Thessalonians, second Thessalonians, the first chapter in the 11th verse. In view of this, we are always praying for you, 
that our God will make you worthy of his calling and by his power fulfill your every desire to do good and your work produced by faith. In you, right? And real this, we want God to, to make you worthy of the calling. And by his power, he will fulfill your every desire to do good. See, see, he's conforming you in this time, conforming you through this walk, conforming you and making you not doing it quickly as it causes us to lean more on Christ to help us fulfill every good work. See, if I was changed in the instance of an eye, of a blink of an eye, if I was changed in the snap of a finger, how would that affect my ability to rely on Christ for everything? The fact that the old man still twitches, the fact that the old man still tries to climb out of the grave and I constantly got to kick him back down makes me rely on Christ even the more. That the beauty of the sanctification process is that I cannot do it within myself, but this makes me lean and trust more on Christ Jesus to bring me on to salvation. Knowing that he has keeping power, knowing that he won't let me fall, knowing that he won't let it overtake me, he's going to take me through the sanctification process and it's going to grow my love and stir my affection for him daily. Amen. One of the best things about my walk is I know it's not me. Yeah. One of the best things about my walk is I know I can't carry myself. One of the best things about my walk is that I know i got to trust him for each and every moment because Marcus is full of sin and Marcus will go back to the old man. Marcus will jump back in the grave and start doing CPR on that old man and try to revive him if I don't lean on Christ Jesus to do the work. That's good. Yes. Lean on Jesus, amen. Right. Let's go to the book of Jude. Come on, yes. I want to drive this home. The book of Jude, i got to tell you a chapter, just verses. If, you, if you're a Bible reader, you know. The 24th verse, this is how it concludes with this incredible doxology. That's a systematic praise. That's our systematic praise. This incredible systematic praise that the writer gives us. He says, now to him who is able to protect you from stumbling. Ah, Jesus. Now to him who is able to protect you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory without blemish. And with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Christ Jesus, our Lord, be glory, majesty, power, and authority be for all time, now and forever. Amen. Look at this incredible praise that Jude gives God. What does Jude say to God? Jude says, oh my goodness. Jude says, now unto them who is able to protect you and keep you from stumbling. That's the word. It brings him greater glory. That he's the one that keeps us from stumbling. Amen. The fact that you go through the war with the flesh brings God glory, not when you sin and give in to the flesh, but when you rely on God to bring you through the. Amen. It brings him more glory. This is what Judah saying. He said, Now unto him who is able to protect you from stumbling and make you stand in the presence of his glory without blemish. The only way we stand before him without blemish is in trusting in the Son. That's it. That's not it. through our own abilities. Amen. That's it. Not through me am I able to stand before him, not because of anything I've, I've done, but because I marvel and I revel and I love his grace and it makes me look at him and look at his great glory that he's able to keep me from stumbling, that I know I can't get over sin on my own, but that he allowed me to die and take part in his death and then lets me take part in his resurrection so I can stand before him blameless. Amen. That's great, great news. It's great, great news. Before all time, now, and forever. It's a forever thing. Oh, Jesus. It's forever. I can stop this sermon right there. It's forever. He keeps you from stumbling forever. He protects you forever. Now unto him. It's all about him. It's all about Jesus. It points to Jesus. Salvation about Jesus. Sanctification about Jesus. The struggle about Jesus. The good fight about Jesus. Paul said, I have run my race. He said, I ran it. I fought the good fight. And I finished my course. Why? Why was it such a powerful saying to end, pretty much end up everything that he wrote to us in scripture? I ran my race. I fought the good fight. This gives glory not to Paul. 
Paul wasn't glorifying so himself. So good. Come on now. So good. Paul was giving glory to God. Now unto him. Unto him. Hallelujah. Paul That's saying it. the same thing. I've ran my race. Come on. I fought the good fight. It's all to him the glory. Let's get back to, to Romans chapter 6. Uh, verse 12. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal bodies so that you obey its desires and do not offer any parts of it in sin as weapons for unrighteousness. But as those who are alive from the dead offer yourselves to God and all parts of yourselves to God as weapons for righteousness. What he's saying is now your, your, your body parts that you use for sin now turn around and use those body parts to serve God. That's good. That's good. Yeah. Everything that's under your command commanded now to serve God. Thank you, Lord. Come on now. Amen. Change with the, the, what you used to do and now give it to God. Verse 14, for sin will not rule over you because you are not under the law, but under grace. Great news again. Amen. The law which no man can keep now no longer rules over us, but now we're under the grace that's given to us freely by Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father. What then should we say? Should we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? In verse 15, again, he reiterates, absolutely not. We do not preach. We do not teach continued sin. We do not preach. We do not teach this hyper grace thing where you just do what you want to do. No, no. We preach the war and the battle and the fight and the continued warring, the continued battle and fight against sin. Sin is never okay. Never, 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 not once is it okay. When we live with that that high, listen, I'm going to do everything I can not to sin. I don't want to sin today. I don't want to sin tomorrow. I hate sin because God hates sin. I do not want to sin. When we stop looking at sin like it's okay and it's not a big deal to sin, then we start warring and fighting again against sin. Yeah. Oh, my God. Wow, good. <clears throat> I know I'm taking a little time, but we're going to get through this. Right. What then should we say? Are we under grace? <laughs> Absolutely not. Verse 16. Do not, do you know that if you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of that one. I'm sorry. You are slaves of that one, of the one you obey. Either of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. Right. But thank God that although you used to be slaves to sin, you obeyed from the heart that pattern of teaching to which you were handed over. But having been set free from sin, you became enslaved to righteousness. You can only serve one master. That's right. That's true. Each, each way has a doctrine. So you are slaves to the teaching of sin. You are practices and partakers of it. Your worldview was a sinful worldview. But now your worldview has changed to a worldview that looks at things through the lens of Christ Jesus. What we talked about earlier today in our new members class was that, that we want to be agents of change through the gospel. And we want to go and share our faith with as many people as possible. Now, now we said, now listen, the way we love people doesn't always look like the, how the world wants us to love people. The love the, world, the, love wants, the love the world wants us to show is just saying everything's okay. Oh, we ain't going to bother you. No judgment. No nothing. You just do what you want to do. We're not going to speak up for Christ. We're not going to speak up to truth. We're not going to proclaim what's in this great book. We're not going to complain, co proclaim the words of Christ. Instead, we're just going to sit back really passive, and they think that's loving. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I often use the example, if you see somebody running to a cliff and you say nothing because you don't want to bother their run, their job. Come on now. That's not love. Right. Love would be yelling, stop! You're about to run off the cliff. What are you doing? No. My God. That's loving. Thank That's showing you care. Great As Christians, we have to yell out, no, stop. Hey, 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 over here. There's a better way. Amen. Yeah. Sin isn't trying to take good things from you. Sin is trying to keep you from things that ultimately will harm you. Come on. Wow. Mm -hmm. wow. So let's keep it going. I uh, know I'm in kind of long. Uh, I'm using a human example, a human analogy is what he's talking about when he's using slavery. We'll get right into the, the, the ending of this. And I'm going to read it in its entirety. We'll break it down. Greater and greater lawlessness, so now offer them as slaves of righteousness, which results in sanctification. 
right? So being now, so you couldn't be slaves to sin. Now you're being slaves to righteousness, and that results in sanctification. So it results in a process, right? Being right. slaves to righteousness, what we already defined as right works, right? So now you're doing the right thing. Now you're acting out the right stuff, right? So that results in the sanctification process, which means that God is making you more and more like his son. It's a process, though. Okay? For when you were slaves to sin, you were free from, uh, free with regard to, uh, to righteousness. So what fruit was produced? What did sin get you? I look at the sum of your life, doing all the sinful stuff. I don't care if you got like a, a, a big bag when you were doing it. I don't care if you had all the honeys when you were doing it. I don't care if it got you in positions of power. I don't care. Whatever, whatever sin did for you in that time, look back at the sum totality of all things. Did sin ultimately produce any good fruit in your life? No. But what does righteousness produce? What does following Christ produce? Eternal life. Eternal, li eternal fruit. My God. Eternal life. My God. Blessings that will never, 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 never cease. Thank you. Let's, let's wrap this up with verse 23. For the wages of sin is death. My God. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus Thank you, Lord. our Lord. As Paul, sister, talking to the group of our, our rights to the group of both Gentiles and Jews. This mixed group of Christian believers now forced together in, in Rome to worship together again after years, five or six years of separation. As now he's telling them, what is it that that that, that what is it that, that we should do with sin? What where should we how should we look at sin? We should look at sin as the wages of death. Sin brings about death, but not go ahead and keep sinning and you still can have eternal life. No, no, no. But that's sin over here. That's the old man. That's the one who's buried. That's the one who's dead. That's the one who's gone. That's the old nature. But you must be born again. What did Nicodemus and Jesus talk about? When Nicodemus met him in the middle of the night, he this high-ranking right, right. uh, 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 Pharisee. Remember the Sanhedrin, this high-ranking guy comes to Jesus in the middle of the night under the cover of darkness because he was embarrassed to talk to Jesus. And he starts to say, Rabbi, we know God is with you because we see these miraculous things that you're doing. Jesus didn't answer him or talk to him about that. He spoke right to his situation and said, you must be born again. Come on. So we must die. So that we can be born again. And the okay. gift that you get when you're born again say that. Come on now. is eternal life. Thank you. Through Christ Jesus. One name, no other name. No other name. No other name. No other way. There's only one door to get into Noah's Ark. Only one door in the construction for Noah's Ark. There's only one door to get onto the Ark of Safety for salvation. There's only one name that allows you to navigate the waves of life. There's only one name that will keep you on the, the roller coasters and the ups and downs and the dangers and the things that we face. There's only one name that is guaranteed to heal depression, disease, and anxiety. There's only one name that is guaranteed to point you out of darkness and into his marvelous life. There's only one name. And it's the name of our Lord and Savior. Christ. And by that name, I beseech you to bury your sin, to let the old man die and be raised in Christ, a new creature. And if you would like that, that's available to you today. Hallelujah. To say, you know what? I'm a sinner. I'm a wrench. I'm done. Paul said this. I'm a sinner. I'm the worst of sinners. I stand in a similar. I'm a sinner. I've done horrible things in my life. But the old man died Hallelujah. upon meeting Christ. And it happened just that quick. Paul one day was killing Christians or agreeing with them being killed. Right, right, right. right, right. The next day, he was, a, he was an apostle. <coughs> now, he had some training and something. But in that quickness right. of meeting Christ on his road to Damascus, I pray tonight is somebody's Damascus road. Come on, now. man. Yeah. It's somebody's night where you just you were doing the wrong thing, but upon meeting Christ, you have now changed. Oh By the power of his gospel. And his gospel is that he loved you while you were yet a sinner. Yeah. While you were not thinking about him, he loved you. That you were uh, uh you have worked the wages. Wages is payment. 
You worked the job of a sinner, and now the payday is coming. There's a, there's a, there's a check with your name on it that says death, hell, and the grave. But Jesus is saying, listen, no, 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 I will take your place. Just give it to me. Give me the, give it to me. Give it to me. I pay for that. I pay for that, and I pay for it in full. Come on, come on. Confess to me. Give it to me, and I will pay that completely. I will wipe away your debt. Hallelujah. I died in your stead. And you can be risen with me. You can come to life again and you'll die no more. That's offered to you tonight. If there's anyone who doesn't know Christ, this is your time to stand. Say, I'm giving my life to Jesus. I'm making a change. If everyone here knows Christ, everyone here is a believer, then I would just ask that you just either stand, raise your hands, I just say, you know, I just want to rededicate to the fact, yes. to the knowing that the old man is dead. Amen. I want to rededicate to the recognition that the old man is buried. I want to rededicate to the recognition that I don't, I don't, I'm not giving sin a pass. I'm not letting sin hold, hold a place in my life. I'm not, I don't have my little corner over here, which God doesn't touch, where everything else is illuminated, but there's a dark corner over here that, that we just allow sin to permeate itself there. No, no, no. We're putting light everywhere. Exposing sin in our life and saying, you know what, Lord, deal with this. Because it's you who holds me unto him who is able to protect me and keep me from sin. Let's pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, for all those with their hands standing, those who are standing in their hearts, those who who, who, who risen their hands or stand on their feet, Lord, we just ask that you just touch them right now. That you bless them in a mighty way, Lord Jesus. That they be reminded of the work that you did on the cross. That they give sin no quarter. That they take no hostages. That they destroy the zombies that are trying to rely, uh, uh, resurrect in their life. That they, 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 they rely on you. And you alone and you completely for the salvation and sanctification process. That you walk us away from sin. That we be, be, be slaves to righteousness. And in that slavery we find true freedom. We ask, Lord Jesus, Hallelujah. that you do this work by your power and your power alone as we worship you and you alone tonight. We just thank you and we give you praise. But I ask that you let this word stay in the hearts and minds of the people, Lord Jesus, that they may call on it as they need, that it encourage, that, that, that it strengthen, that it lift up those in need. I just thank you and give you the praise in Jesus' name.